Right. Um, so this is just going to be a brief talk about perk screws and, and uh, we'll, we'll dive into the technical parts pretty quickly. Um, obviously, we do this to preserve the, the multifidi muscles for the most part, uh, the paraspinal musculature and their critical nature in stabilizing the uh, residual segments of the spine that continue to move. Sometimes we have to do this, uh, but most of the deep gen spine that we do, uh, fortunately, we have other options. And um, it really is has been the workhorse for MIS uh, through fluoroscopy over the past couple decades. And now we have more advanced techniques with, with navigation, robotics, and other things. Uh, but knowing how to do good fluoroscopic placement, it's still an important tool in your toolbox. Um, you do not want to be one of those surgeons that cannot do perk screws or, or MIS screws without uh, the navigation platforms or, or robotics because the reality is sometimes those systems go down, sometimes they're erroneous. Um, just like a pilot needs to know how to land uh, in dangerous situations or fly without an autopilot, you, you as a surgeon should know how to place screws uh, without fancy equipment and to keep yourself out of trouble. Um, as, you're, as you're thinking about placing uh, perk screws or MIS screws, um, the starting points you see here are not always going to be visible, and so you have to sort of find those uh, through imaging-based uh, platforms, whether they're old school or new school. Um, and one of those things that you will, you will be able to use on occasion and, um, for finding starting points is simply your finger. Uh, and sensing anatomy. Uh, when you use fluoroscopy, you're going to use all these different uh, uh, angles. Uh, you, you're going to have to cant or Ferguson the machine, as you see on the right, or rainbow, as you see on the left. Uh, ultimately, you want to find good AP uh, views of the vertebra uh, so that the spine is processed in the center there, bisects the interpedicular distance here. And uh, sometimes there's irregularity, you have to be prepared for that. Uh, but generally that's the kind of look you want to have to include the parallel end plates above and below. So you, you have a, a true AP of the vertebra. Uh, and then on lateral, you also want to have nice on fos views of the, or profile views of the end plates. And ideally with the pedicles superimposed, those are all uh, important perspectives, whether it's a, a perk screw or even a, a lateral inner body. Incision planning varies depending on, on your um, personal preference uh, or the particular uh, circumstances. When we first started doing perk screws, a lot of people would use these individual um, individual stab wounds you see on the left with the green arrows. Um, I think a lot of us have migrated to more of a wilt seed, as you see on the right, which tends to be a little shorter and a little more cosmetically appealing incision through which you can put both screws. Uh, this also allows um, another nice part of the technique, which reduces fluoroscopy if you continue to use that, and that is you can get your finger in there, bluntly dissect through the muscle uh, in a nice uh, manner, and palpate the bony anatomy. And if you do that, what you'll start finding is just your finger can, can help you find the right ending point, and, um, and you really can be pretty close to where you need to start your jab sheeting needle or starting tool without much uh, which, uh, without much fluoro uh, needed. You can, you can find that after probably 10, 20 cases of doing that, you'll almost have yourself on target uh, just with finger use and palpating the anatomy, kind of a nice feature. And then on the bottom, I say hybrid midline. That's, that's a, it's probably something you'll think more about doing with long uh, deformity uh, or long perk screw kind of cases, uh, depending on the, the length. It allows you to use a more cosmetically favorable midline skin and then fascial paramedian um, muscle splitting rather than uh, too, too long uh, side incisions or paraspinal incisions. Um, and that's just dealer's preference, no, no uh, reason you have to do one or the other. Incision planning you see here uh, varies depending on who's doing it. You can get crazy with a bunch of, of plastic surgeon markups of the skin. Um, or, or uh, you can simply, and you see one here, um, 
but you can also just uh, as time goes on be a little more strategic with your use of fluoro and and find uh, singular starting points uh, or mid pole incision points on either side over the disc base, say, as, at a single level, and use that as your targeting mechanism. So, uh, as you start out, getting a little more uh, uh, a little more extravagant with all your markups is not a bad idea. But I think you'll find you can get very efficient. And in general, as you see on the left, your incision doesn't actually have to extend from the top of uh, one pedicle to the bottom of the subadjacent pedicle, really can be uh, probably two thirds of that distance, uh, maybe even half of that distance to accomplish placement in both locations. Um, and your your mid, are you guys seeing my cursor? Are they seeing my cursor or no? Yes. Yep. Okay. Yeah, we so, do now. So generally, if you're, if you're targeting your incision, say for this level, um, I, I would simply take a, an image and mark the skin right about here, right in the mid portion of this arrow, or really honestly close to the to the disc space, uh, maybe the, the caudal, I'm sorry, the cephalad aspect of the, um, the disc space and just lateral to the pedicle. That's kind of a mid pulley incision, then a centimeter above that centimeter below will give you excursion enough to, uh, to get where you need. Uh, but don't shortchange yourself too medial with your incision it's much harder to bring yourself lateral than it is to push uh, muscle tissue medial um, so if anything you err a little bit lateral and, and you can make that work the incision length as i said it, it really depends on your fixation uh, perk screws come with some very big sturdy towers that provide a lot of functionality with compression and distraction and fortitude and then there's extended tabs that are pretty wimpy um, with respect to all this other functions but very sexy with respect to using a very small incision you can get a lot done within a, a centimeter and a half or two at most so you really have to vary the 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 distance of the incision relative to the convergence or divergence of the screws so as an example l12 l23 you're going to tend to need to make a longer incision because those levels are really um, uh, not uh, lordotic at all and so the screws and therefore the screw heads and towers will not converge on one another outside the skin if you're working down at l45 or l5s1 uh, your incision can be much smaller because of that favorability of converging towers when you're landing um, and you can see this is not a perfect ap but uh, nonetheless if you look at this pedicle your starting point uh, for, before entry to the bone tends to need to be around this um, this, we'll call it three and nine uh, o'clock points of the pedicle circle um, and, and at the cortical line or just, just lateral to it. And that will tend to get you where you need to be. And you can see here, as you're, as you're moving the jam sheet or needle or kyphon needle, whatever you're using into position, you want to start that on AP and you want to put your tip of the device um, in and and then uh, get yourself to the to the medial wall, but not beyond uh, before you assess um, one of two things or both your depth uh, and or your lateral view to ensure that you're in the vertebral body before you go past this medial wall. Um, and, and here you can see that look. So this would be an ideal circumstance where you've just reached the medial wall on the AP. Uh, you have gotten into the vertebral body on the lateral view, and that tells you you are safely within the pedicle, not too medial, not too lateral. If you had taken this shot and this needle was way into the vertebral body, uh, what might that tell you? Amber? Any guesses on, on where you would be potentially? Or where you would uh, ideally not be? <laughs> too deep on the on the ladder here you're, you're well far beyond where you thought you were and you're still here on the uh, can you repeat that sorry i was having trouble hearing you on the okay. last part that's okay uh, if i was too deep where if you look like you're fine on your ap view uh -huh. your your needle hair is at the medial wall your tools at the medial wall but then you go to lateral view and the same tool is now deeply into the body where my cursor is almost all the way through 
what might be a, a dilemma there? Um, well, you could have uh, possibly, um, well, you wouldn't be too far medial breached medial because nope. nope. you're maybe too lateral. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so that's important because you you can that could mean that your your entry point was too lateral and you actually don't have good capture of your lateral cortical wall. So those are important uh, um, positions to juxtapose, uh, and and you can use distance. So if you if you're using a graded jam sheety or use a, a marking pen, once you are on the bone, you or you can just visually inspect the the skin relative to a point that's about 25 or 30 millimeters above the skin. You want to go in about 25 or 30 millimeters at the point that you're at this medial wall, and that should give you also confidence that you you should be into the vertebral body at that point without even having to go to lateral. So that's another sort of cheating technique to ensure that you're about here simply with looking at the excursion of the needle at the surface of the skin. You got to plan ahead on that one and, and pay attention to where you start. Uh, the other helpful view um, for ensuring you're in the pedicle and, and even more importantly, not in the facet joint is this on FOSS view. So you can roll the C-arm over the top and uh, look straight down the pedicle, which often will, will help you look uh, in the facet joint. And I think you saw that a little bit on this view. If you look right above the tool here, you actually see the facet joint. And so that will depend on the tropism of the facet joint. Some of them are very coronal, some are very sagittal, um, some between. Uh, obviously that changes as you go from caudal to cephalad in the lumbar spine. But whatever level you're at in that on FOS view, uh, take a look at the pedicle. You should be able to see the facet joint and make sure that you're not violating it. It is a uh, a problem to violate the facet joint at the upper screw or cephalad screw because uh, that joint needs to continue moving. Um, it's a source of um, uh, potential persistent pain, destruction of that adjacent joint, and um, and requires removal eventually if, um, if it's uh, symptomatic, which it, it typically is if you violate the joint. So that's a nice view that you can do just to confirm you're you're well centered in the in the um, pedicle as well, uh, and then once you have everything in the wires, uh, you can go to your your lateral view. And really, the lateral view is the workhorse for tapping. And you want to do that with K wires, especially with soft bones, so you don't drive wires through the front of the vertebral body. That's a no no. Uh, ideally, that doesn't happen. So get in your lateral view, take a few shots as you're putting the the um, the tap even into place because if you're um, you're applying a little downward force coaxial to the K wire, um, it is uh, easier than you think to drive these wires through the front of the body uh, if you just simply jam the, those devices in. So you, you sort of wiggle them in and bend in the wind like a reed to get your your tool, whether it's a tap or a, a screw down to the surface of the bone and then you start your rotations. Uh, but sometimes the, these cannulated devices, instruments, tools get gunked up. Uh, there's fretting of the wires, and they can they can bind. And if you just jam things down, you can push the wires out into areas you don't want to be. Uh, that can cause bowel injury, vessel injury. So it's really important not to do that. As you're placing your screws, uh, generally speaking, to avoid what I just said, um, you want to insert your screws to the point of entry to the body. Once you get into the vertebral body, uh, through the tip of the screw, you can pull your wires so you avoid any of those uh, iatrogenic injuries to, to structures ventral to the spine. Uh, and then once you have your screws in place, and, and one of the nuances with MIS screw placement over open screw placement is you can't see what you're doing. It's a fill thing. Um, you, you need to take some images as you get close. Uh, and then slow down as you get closer to sort of that end stage. Um, either Cameron or, or Amber, any knowledge on what happens to screw pull out resistance if you over insert it and then back it off? I.e. crack through the facet wall or thoughts Well, about if it? you crack through the pedicle or the facet wall, you lose your um, 
hoop stresses of your pedicle. And so your pull out strength, I think, would go down. It does pretty, pretty dramatically, about 40 percent. Uh, so like I said, when you do an open, it's kind of, you know, a, a monkey can do that. You can see exactly what you're doing. If you're doing it this way, you have to be um, checking yourself. So as you're sort of getting used to a system, um, even different systems have different fills. Take a few more shots on lateral, make sure you know where you're at. And then as you get close, um, I, I find it helpful to slow down on your rotation, use your fingers and really feel the buildup and resistance. And, and you'll feel it kind of build as you get close, but don't over insert that, that compromises the integrity of the screw. These are just examples of incisions. They can be pretty elegant. Like I said, I like a single incision rather than the four or I'm sorry, the two um, uh, per screw just looks a little nicer, a little more cosmetically appealing. These are these are old school um, Medtronic screws. You can see here that one of the first systems that ever came out. And um, and obviously nav will help us a great deal here um, in terms of efficiency. It will take steps out most likely, uh, but hopefully uh, you all will will gain confidence in doing this both uh, old school uh, as well as new school so you can accommodate any situation and and be able to deliver care in any scenario it's as you saw this weekend care in in other uh, places doesn't always allow for this um i've i've been called by old fellows or uh, um, uh, acquaintances that have have essentially not been able to go to certain hospitals or take on new practices because they couldn't do things without these kind of fancy systems and i think that's a tragedy i think if you're uh, it, it'll probably make you a better now surgeon to be able to do this under under uh, sort of uh, three-dimensional awareness and fluoroscopic technique instead of just kind of the the video game part of the the equation so that's it i got to blast through that sorry that it, it went a little faster than expected but any questions about um Perk screws, the, the thoracic spine is really not particularly different in terms of these techniques. The landing spot's a little different. Um, obviously, you're, you're, Here's what I found. you're landing on a transverse process that is angled up and away rather than um, purchasing on a wall that is uh, in the direction that you're taking the screw. And that can provide some challenges, but it's, it's actually, uh, for all intents and purposes, very similar, just with tighter um, constraints and tolerances in terms of pedicle size for, for some of those. Um, the, the wires that you use will be varied as well when you're doing this kind of uh, cannulated perk technique, uh, stainless steel, um, night and all. You have, to, you have to choose what you like. We, we tend to use a fair bit more night and all, um, and that has reduced some of the risk of sharing pieces of pin off. Uh, one of the things that can happen if you're not collinear with your wires is that as you're putting screws in, if you're off plane, you you can shear the wire off. That's another reason we pull the wires back quickly once the screw tip is entering the vertebral body, so you don't get any of those um, situations where the the screw is offline a little bit and pinches off a little bit of the wire out front. In addition to pushing the wire out of the front. Um, and then even even consider uh, the wires themselves and the tips sharp versus blunt um, and you you could vary that depending on bone quality if you're working with osteoporotic bone you probably want more blunt because the sharp will very easily pierce the front of the vertebral body and move through the soft bone into places you don't want it uh, more readily uh, so you want to be thoughtful about each one of those steps uh, the perk and and mis screws have uh, also come with newer advents such as single step where you, you simply place the screw. It's got sharp, uh, a sharp tip. It's got uh, self um, tapping threads. And so you can just place the screws themselves without any, uh, any work ahead of that with single step devices. And that can increase efficiency. Uh, the challenge with those is that this allows you to do any work internally uh, very easily anyway because you've really placed the screws with towers and can't access the facet joints or any other uh, pathology that you may have wanted to get to. Uh, 
one of the advantages of going in with these kind of uh, wiltsy approaches is you can actually uh, use tubes or, or mini open sort of uh, views to get down and uh, do little releases of the facet joints. Um, uh, you can even do fancier stuff like uh, uh, minor PCOs if you need to and deformities either through those paramedian approaches or that midline skin and then paramedian fascial approaches or midline mini open fascial approaches to do uh, releases should you need them in, in more uh, um, deformity level cases. Um, one other one other trick or technique that I, I will share with you that's not on the talk, but something to be thinking about when you're doing MIS screws is sacral screws. Sacral S1 screws are pretty wimpy. They tend to loosen. They 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 tend to be the the most challenged screws you'll put in in the lumbosacral spine in terms of the durability and fixation. And so this this uh, appearance on the low left of angling up at the promontory is important. And if you can get bicortical purchase, that's even better. Now, when you do that open, you can punch through the front of the cortex uh, quite easily um, with a blunt device and know that you're through and kind of palpate it, palpate it with your blood tip probe or your ball tip probe, rather. In MIS, you don't have that luxury. And so your, your alternative in MIS to get bicortical is to use um, a, a heavy Ferguson view. So you take the, uh, the C-arm and you angle it to look down this way. Okay, that means you're gonna swing the intensifier down um, towards the rear end or the, feet, the foot of the patient um, and look down this, this sort of anterior cortex of the sacrum um, as you're tapping, as you're putting a jam sheeting uh, wire tap and or screw. If it's really hard bone, you're gonna have to go through with the jam sheeting to get through that cortex, but you can, with that, that view, you will be able to see the anterior cortex of the sacrum and then get your screws to uh, to achieve that bicortical or, or uh, even tricortical purchase of the sacrum, uh, which is really important in cases like this that you're seeing in order to resist failure of that S1 screw before consolidation of the fusion. Any questions? Hey, Dr. Eastlack, it's Jay. Thanks so much. That was super informative and educational. With those single step devices that you described, um, do you feel that you lose any tactile feedback? You know, some people will, with that wire, they'll pulse it right in and out to make sure that they're collinear, like you mentioned. And I always wondered with those single step devices, if you lose any of that with the wire kind of built into the cannulated screw, or do you think it's a safe and nice innovation or nowhere to fall on that? I, I actually think it's it's uh, a more efficient tool depending on what your needs are. So, um, you know, I tend to, when I'm doing spondies or um, other, it, when I'm doing things that require any thoughtful consideration for realignment, either even segmentally or reductions of spondies, I tend not to want to use that kind of fixation device because it it limits my capacity to release and maneuver the spine in a way that offloads the screws. Um, if in a case where I've got everything where I want it through whatever I did before, whether it's an anterior inner body or lateral, if everything's perfect and all I need are the screws, I think it's a great solution. The problem is I you don't always know that, you know, so you can order the stuff, but if you haven't got you through other means, then you have to bail on that single step and and uh, use the traditional stuff so that you can actually go release sets or if you don't do that and you just overdrive the screws then you run the risk of loosening them or creating some failure mechanism um, during the course of healing that you you might not have otherwise incurred so you know in my mind um i think they're totally fine in that in the setting where you don't need to change anything and the bone's not incredibly hard where where i think you run into trouble with those is you have uh, you know, young, a young male with incredibly hard bone. I, I've had trouble with those, you know, as you might imagine. I mean, you, those are the kind of folks you have to tap to be sure you can actually get the screw in without struggling yourself or even cracking the bone. So, um, you know, young, hard, uh, particularly male bone, I'd, I'd probably be a little careful with using that kind of technology, but I wouldn't worry about it otherwise. I mean, if you got average bone, soft bone, um, I, I don't think you're you're in worse stead using those screws versus 
a typical uh, uh, guide wire and, and screw. And, and it does reduce the risk of, of having errant wires or pushing wires out. I mean, that's the one upside that you have with those kind of tools. Got it. Thanks so much. Well, I'll add to that. Like, I, you know, there's a what Bob was saying about the tactile nature of what we do um, with perk screws is different than open. Um, and it's very true with these screws for sure, because as you're putting it in, you're relying on the screw to take advantage of the cancellous channel of the pedicle. And if all of a sudden, you know, you're like whatever, halfway or three fourths of the way through and all of a sudden the resistance changes, that's a problem. And you need to immediately stop turning the screw and you need to immediately recognize where you're at um, and go from there. I think these screws, honestly, with fluoro are not as good. I think with nav are baller uh, because yeah. you're you're much more confident of where you're at. And some of those things that Bob even just mentioned, like if you see big overgrown lateral facet, you know, you may be able to preemptively tackle that rather than in the floral world, you're you're not seeing some of that detail that you might see on nav when you're like trying to get your starting point in the right place. So I like the screws in nav for sure. I think in fluoro, I think you have to be you have to be thoughtful, just like Bob said. You can't just go willy nilly. You need to you need to think about it just just a bit. Um, with bone again, bone quality and the, the potential aberrant anatomy that you recognize on your on your scans. Awesome. Thanks so much. You bet.